antenatal corticosteroids to reduce neonatal morbidity and mortality. Background Antenatal corticosteroids are effective not only in reducing respiratory distress syndrome or RDS, but also in reducing other complications of prematurity such as intraventricular hemorrhage or IVH. What are the benefits of antenatal corticosteroids? Antenatal steroids are associated with a significant reduction in rates of neonatal death, RDS or respiratory distress syndrome, and intraventricular hemorrhage and are safe for the mother. Antenatal corticosteroids have no known benefits for the mother. A Cochrane review of 21 studies showed that treatment of women at risk of preterm birth with a single course of antenatal corticosteroids reduced the risk of neonatal death by 31%, respiratory distress syndrome by 44%, and intraventricular hemorrhage by 46%. Antenatal corticosteroid use is also associated with a reduction in necrotizing enterocolitis, respiratory support, intensive care admissions, and systemic infections in the first 48 hours of life compared with no treatment or treatment with placebo. At what gestation should antenatal steroids be used? Clinicians should offer a single course of antenatal corticosteroids to women between 24 plus 0 and 34 plus 6 weeks of gestation who are at risk of preterm birth. Antenatal corticosteroids can be considered for women between 23 plus 0 and 23 plus 6 weeks of gestation who are at risk of preterm birth. The decision to administer corticosteroids at gestations less than 24 plus 0 weeks should be made at a senior level, taking all clinical aspects into consideration. Trial data are scanty for pregnancies at the extreme of prematurity. Obstetricians currently have the discretion to administer steroids before the 24th week of pregnancy but the whole clinical picture needs to be taken into account with respect to intact survival data as well as the chance of any survival based on antenatal assessment of viability at these extremes, for example, by estimation of fetal weight. In this context, we have advised caution and discussion at senior level prior to considering antenatal corticosteroid administration at 23 plus 0 to 23 plus 6 weeks of gestation. How long after administration is a course of antenatal corticosteroids most effective? Antenatal corticosteroids are most effective in reducing respiratory distress syndrome in pregnancies that deliver 24 hours after and up to 7 days after administration of the second dose of antenatal corticosteroids. Antenatal corticosteroid use reduces neonatal death within the first 24 hours and therefore should still be given even if delivery is expected within this time. Reduction in respiratory distress syndrome is seen in infants more than up to 7 days after the first dose. No reduction in neonatal death, respiratory distress syndrome, or cerebroventricular hemorrhage is seen in infants delivered more than 7 days after treatment with antenatal corticosteroids. Antenatal corticosteroid use reduces neonatal death even when infants are born less than 24 hours after the first dose has been given. How safe is the use of antenatal corticosteroids? Women may be advised that the use of a single course of antenatal corticosteroids does not appear to be associated with any significant short-term maternal or fetal adverse effects. Evidence on the longer-term benefits and risk of a single course of antenatal corticosteroids shows no clear difference in adverse neurological or cognitive effects. There is still insufficient evidence on the longer-term benefits 
and risk of multiple courses of antenatal corticosteroids. Multivariant analysis in humans have shown that increasing the number of glucocorticoid exposures for the purpose of enhancing lung maturation prior to preterm birth is associated with reduced birth weight and behavioral disorders at three years of age. The Cochrane Review and other studies have shown that a single course of corticosteroid therapy for preterm birth results in benefit without causing significant adverse effects such as neonatal or maternal sepsis. Are there any contraindications to the use of antenatal corticosteroids? Caution should be exercised when giving corticosteroid therapy to women with systemic infection, including tuberculosis or sepsis. Corticosteroids suppress the immune system, so there is a risk that their use may activate latent infection or exacerbate fungal infections. In a woman with systemic infection, it may theoretically suppress the immune response to infection. There is no evidence to suggest that a single course of corticosteroids would have a profound effect in women with systemic infection, but caution should be exercised in its use. Senior opinion should be sought when contemplating delaying delivery for steroid prophylaxis in cases of overt chorioamnionitis. Clinical chorioamnionitis is significantly associated with both cystic periventricular leukomalacia and cerebral palsy. This would suggest that with chorioamnionitis, a course of antenatal corticosteroids may be started but should not delay delivery if indicated by maternal or fetal condition. Who should receive antenatal corticosteroids? Antenatal corticosteroids should be given to all women at risk of iatrogenic or spontaneous preterm birth up to 34 plus 6 weeks of gestation. Antenatal corticosteroids should be given to all women for whom an elective cesarean section is planned prior to 38 plus 6 weeks of gestation. There is no evidence to support a practice of prophylactic steroids in women with a previous history of preterm delivery or multiple pregnancy who show no signs of being at risk of iatrogenic or spontaneous preterm birth. There is evidence of benefit in all major subgroups of preterm babies, such as women with premature rupture of membranes and pregnancy-related hypertension syndromes, as well as the other subgroups. A single course of antenatal corticosteroids should be considered routine for preterm delivery with few exemptions. In multifetal pregnancy, clinicians should continue to offer a single course of antenatal corticosteroid treatment to women with multiple pregnancy at risk of imminent iatrogenic or spontaneous preterm delivery between 24 plus 0 and 34 plus 6 weeks of gestation. The optimal dose and pharmacokinetics in multiple pregnancies is not clearly understood. Evidence suggests that multiple pregnancy attenuates the beneficial effect of antenatal steroids. In women with diabetes mellitus, diabetes mellitus is not a contraindication to antenatal corticosteroid treatment for fetal lung maturation. Women with impaired glucose tolerance or diabetes who are receiving fetal steroids should have additional insulin according to an agreed protocol and be closely monitored. Maternal hyperglycemia can adversely affect fetal lung maturity. It is possible that any benefit of corticosteroids could be offset by corticosteroid-induced hyperglycemia. However, the National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence, or NICE, has published a clinical guideline for diabetes in pregnancy that states that diabetes should not be considered a contraindication to antenatal corticosteroids in women undergoing elective cesarean section. Elective lower segment cesarean section should normally be performed at or after 39 plus 0 weeks of gestation 
to reduce respiratory morbidity. Corticosteroids should be given to reduce the risk of respiratory morbidity in all babies delivered by elective cesarean section prior to 38 to 6 weeks of gestation. Studies have shown that delivery by elective cesarean section at less than 39 plus 0 weeks of gestation can lead to respiratory morbidity in neonates requiring admission to the neonatal intensive care unit. Elective lower segment cesarean section should not normally be performed until 39 plus 0 weeks of gestation rather than the administration of antenatal corticosteroids. In pregnancies with fetal growth restriction, pregnancies affected by fetal growth restriction between 24 plus 0 and 35 plus 6 weeks of gestation at risk of delivery should receive a single course of antenatal corticosteroids. There is evidence to suggest that antenatal corticosteroids have an effect on cerebral blood flow in growth-restricted fetuses that is different from that in normally grown fetuses. The benefits from antenatal corticosteroids for early preterm growth-restricted infants appear to outweigh the possible adverse effects. What is the best dose and route of administration for a course of antenatal corticosteroids? Pethamethasone 12 mg given intramuscularly in two doses or dexamethasone 6 mg given intramuscularly in four doses are the steroids of choice to enhance lung maturation. A large non-randomized retrospective study has suggested that infants exposed to antenatal bethamethasone have less neonatal cystic periventricular leukomalacia than infants exposed to antenatal dexamethasone. The Cochrane Review on the Antenatal Corticosteroids for Accelerating Fetal Lung Maturation for Women at Risk of Preterm Birth suggests that bethamethasone treatment causes a larger reduction in respiratory distress syndrome than dexamethasone. When should an antenatal course of corticosteroids be repeated? Weekly repeat courses of antenatal corticosteroids reduce the occurrence and severity of neonatal respiratory disease, but the short-term benefits are associated with a reduction in weight and head circumference. Weekly repeat courses are not recommended. A single rescue course may be considered with caution in pregnancies where the initial course was given at less than 26 plus 0 weeks of gestation. Senior opinion should be sought if a rescue course is to be considered. A rescue course of 2 doses of 12 mg bethamethasone or 4 doses of 6 mg dexamethasone should only be considered with caution in those pregnancies where the first course was given at less than 26 plus 0 weeks of gestation and another obstetric indication arises later in pregnancy. Observational studies in humans have suggested that multiple courses of steroids may lead to possible harmful effects including growth delay, brain developmental delay, lung development problems, necrotizing enterocolitis, maternal and neonatal sepsis, adrenal gland insufficiency, and placental infarction.